Hello. Did everyone sign in so you could get credit? <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, all of you, and thank you, Joanna, for inviting me. Um, it's 75 in California right now, so it's a big change for me, but, um, but it's awesome. I, I don't think it's been since I was 15 that I've been in the snow, so it's been a long time. Um, but I'm super excited to be here with all of you. Feel free to ask me any questions as I'm talking. A lot of the, the issues that I touch on there tend to be sometimes controversial, and there's a lot of um, you know people. For me, what's important that I've learned about communication, which I think when you deal with these topics, that's what you do, is people listen to be able to um, rebuttal and not be able to understand. So I hope I'm able to do that with all of you. Um, I know that there's individuals in here that perhaps are not artists, and I love that because I hope that what I do is able to communicate to everybody, not just people who are um, artists. And um, I think that's the hope of you know, a creative person, is that what we do um, is able to touch on topics of humanity and um, give us a better understanding of somebody else's experience. So this is me. I'm going to show some selected work from 2007 to 2018. Um, what I'm, I'm going to skip through some things because uh, I got a lot of stuff. I got like 100 and something images, so I'm just going to be bam, 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 because, uh, or else we're never going to finish. But if something resonates or stands out to you, please let me know. I usually like to start off with this image. Uh, this is an image of myself as a little boy. My mom and Donnie, who was the son of the lady my mom cleaned houses for. As a kid, my mom used to take me with her um, as she went and cleaned houses. Now, what's so, I guess you would say, distinct about this is that it doesn't happen anymore, and it really, never, really doesn't happen. But I have met... This lady, her name was uh, Mary Pat Carlisi that my mom worked for, and um, she took us in, and it was like we were family to her. So this is my first experience of, uh, I guess you would say, um, two cultures coming together, uh, and that, I believe, has shaped what I do as an artist. I'm very much interested in how two cultures connect and the tensions that people have within cultures. That's where I start with this body of work. Um, this body, body of work is called uh, Fallen Nature and the Two Cities. And what I was doing with this body of work is I was really thinking about, like, wow, you know, I grew up in a predominantly Latino neighborhood, and um, I always remember there being tension between African Americans and Latinos growing up, particularly in my schools and stuff like that. There's a lot of, you know, what they called race, race wars or race, you know, problems. And uh, so I wanted to create a body of work that de dealt with finding some commonalities between these cultures. And at the time that I did this, I think it was about 2007, the lined up fade, which is a, you know, faded on the side and lined up at the front was like really popular. And so I said, well, it, I see it in both cultures. So I wanted to create a dialogue within that barbershop culture. So um, in here, I created like this grid you see, if you go to a particular barbershop, if they cater to African-American males, they're going to have African-American models, right? If they cater to Latinos, they're going to have Latino models. But I wanted to create a poster that essentially you could insert into a barbershop and engage in a conversation without really talking about these issues, just by looking at an image. And so what I did is I reinserted these posters into barbershops and... Um, in both African American and Latino barbershops. And so here, this is a, a just in time. The piece is called Fade Away, and it's in this barbershop. Um, and part of this work, by the way, um, so many of you are undergrads. Who's, who's an art major, if I could get a raise of hands here? So there's a couple of you are art majors. Who's a studio art major? Oh, it went down a little bit. OK, cool. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so this was when I was getting my BFA. This was my undergrad show. 
And one of the things I, I like to tell you is that um, never, do your best when you're in school. This work I've shown in museums, and I, and I was, when they asked me to put it in a museum, I was like, whoa, okay, cool. This is my undergrad work. I didn't tell them it was my undergrad work. But you never know, so document your work, and that's always like a good tip I tell my students. But so what I did is, in these images, you see, um, I started off by taking uh, my Latino friends into Latino barbershops to get their haircuts, and then my African-American friends into African-American barbershops to get their haircut. And then I switched it around. I took my Latino friends into African-American barbershops, and vice versa. So I was really interested to see what, what, was, what would happen if I did that. And I was like, well, I didn't think about it too much. I just wanted to see what happens when somebody who doesn't particularly inhabit a particular space goes to that space and experiences that space. Um, and what I found out was pretty interesting. Um, I'll show you just little clips here. Oh, I didn't connect the volume. It's okay. We don't need the volume. Oh, actually, it is connected. Let me scoot up. But in the video, I keep on, it's just like these still shots. They're in the barbershop, and I film what's going on around in the barbershop. It's a seven minute video, so I won't show it all, but here I haven't really um, thrown anything that's out of the, you know, unusual. Here is where it, it, it starts to change, right? Anyway, um, what I found interesting is I took one of my friends into, um, and there's, there's some talk in there too, but I took one of my friends into a, a, a Latino barbershop in East LA. He's African American, and um, we walked in and the one of the barbers said, oh, come on in, I'm, I'm, I don't have anyone waiting, we'll cut your hair. And I said, well, it's not for me, it's for my friend. And he says, oh, we don't cut that kind of hair. And I was like, whoa, that made me feel bad inside. I was like, did I do something bad here? Or like, why didn't I think about that this, this, this will happen? And I, and I was like, is it because he doesn't know how, or is it because he has prejudices, right? And then he said, but hold on, I, I think I got somebody. And he goes down... He goes out to the barbershop and he says, hey, so-and-so, come over here. And the guy comes and he says, oh, um, yeah, I'll cut your hair. Uh, do I go against the grain, with the grain? Do you get bumps? He was asking all the right questions. Well, it turns out that this guy, um, he was a barber in the jail system. And basically, he said, every time I cut the brother's hair, I used to mess it up and I was getting in so many fights that he said, why don't you show me how to cut your hair so I don't get in so many fights? And he learned, and because uh, it's different, and and it is different. Um, in this process, I ended up cutting hair, and now I cut my boy's hair. But I learned how to do fades. I learned how to do all that stuff. And I've cut my friend's hair, who's African American, and it's it's different, you know. So, um, but you don't know these things unless you interact with people, right? Because you don't think about those things because it's not in your immediate. Um, it's not part of your world, right? All right. Um, so I was also interested, any questions by the way so far? Anybody have any questions? No? All right. Um, I was also living in Monrovia doing, two, this is 2008, and um, there were some shootings that happened, and they were, essentially it was, it was racially charged. It started out being by gangs, but then it would be one African American gang member would go into a Latino uh, community and shoot, and then it would go back and forth. And um, I did these sweaters. Where do they come from? The idea, when I was growing up in the 80s, you would have these, the homeboys used to wear these sweaters when somebody passed away. So these are from, these are uh, Norteños, which is the northern side of uh, California, and there, you know, somebody passed away and they'll do these. Now they do like decals on cars and stuff like that. So I did mine in the, the people that passed away uh, in this neighborhood of Monrovia. Uh, Sanders Rollins, Samantha Salas, and Brandon Lee. There was actually four 
my wife, who's a therapist, worked with one of the boys that got shot, and, uh, but he survived, but they didn't survive. So, I, I mean, I, I put the papers in, I got permission. No, I didn't get permission. You know, I just kind of went up there and clandestinely at night put them up there, and they lasted for like about a month. So I was really surprised that they were up there for a month. And it was at, a, at, this, at this park. Um, in, you know, for me, um, I was really interested in engaging in the community. I think as artists, a lot of time we have these ideas and they function in within the, the gallery space. But in here, it's like they're uh, functioning within the community, which I was super invested and interested in. Um, all right, how much time do I have, by the way? Oh, until five. Okay, I'll make sure I have enough time for questions and stuff like that. Cool. Um, so this video, it's kind of yucky, so I'm going to speed through a little bit, of it, but I'll kind of preface it. Um, I did this in grad school, and it was one of my friends who's African-American. He's mixed, but he, he sees himself as African-American. Um, we did this video where we casted chocolate guns and, and began to eat them, so... You'll see a little bit here. So I've shown this, I, show, I showed this in Guatemala in a, in a gallery space, but I haven't shown, and in LA I showed it once. I haven't shown it in a long time. Uh, but essentially, we eat this gun, it gets to be too much, and, um, and it gets to be too much. Anyway, there goes that. <laughs> uh, but the idea, the idea was that, is that violence, it's, it's almost like romanticized, but particularly within like cinema and just in society. And we take it in, but we, we can't hold it, and it just gags us because it's too much. And for me, it was really looking at both of these cultures having these tensions and metaphoric, bless you, metaphorically, you know, creating an artwork that addresses these issues, um, which I've been invested uh, for some time. Um, and then I just wanted to show you this piece. Um, it's part of another body of work, but I took it out for the sake of time, uh, that body of work. But this is a pre-Columbian bowl, uh, for, uh, a Mayan pre-Columbian um, bowl pot. And uh, it has the, you know, during the 1980s to have, you know, the, the, the continent of Africa, you know, was a symbol for black power. So to have those two things combined, it's called before and after Columbus. So the premise is that before and after Columbus, there's been a relationship or a tie between both cultures. So um, I'm going to skip this, but I'll just go through the images real quick. Some De deals with domestic violence. I just want to talk about some other stuff that's um, related to the exhibition that you're, you're going to see, which I haven't seen either. So, <laughs> Joanna didn't send me images. She said, oh, I want to surprise you. No, she didn't say that, but I'm, I'm assuming that's what she did. All right, I'll go here. Um, so, have any of you heard Made in LA? Made in LA. It's a biennial, uh, kind of like the Whitney Biennial that you have in New York. So this is our version. 2012 was the first one. I was in the first one. And um, I created this piece that was right out the entrance of the location where it was at. Uh, this is at uh, the LA Municipal Art Gallery. And it's a rug that's made out of sawdust. So if you look closely, they, it has like statements that deal with domestic violence. So this one, machismo mata todos los días, machismo kills every day. He says it won't happen again. Uh, Madre me de besos, no de trancasos, which translate to beat me up with kisses, not with punches. No more hurt, pain, and violence. Um, so I, I wanted to do something that addressed um, you know, domestic violence using a medium that I was, that I grew up with, uh, that was part of Guatemalan culture. 
And essentially what ends up happening is people walk on it. So it is made out of sawdust. And uh, a whole bunch of people walked over it. And at the end, it looks like this. So here you'll have uh, the procession. So for Holy Week in Guatemala, they create these rugs. And uh, essentially, uh, they're either giving t thanks or it's something about Christ. Um, and, um, and the procession goes over, kind of like Palm, Palm Sunday. So it's not like they're destroying them. A lot of people say, hey, they're destroying them. But it's more like uh, the artwork's coming into completion. And um, that, this, was, this was my version of it. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in is, is um, uh, I guess you would say social work. Although my wife, who's a social worker, tells me, you can't use that term. I'm a social worker. I got, I'm, I got, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I said, yeah, well, OK, cool. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I like using, uh, wor doing work that deals with those issues because I, I worked as a behavioral specialist for 14 years. So in, in that, what ended up happening is that um, I would, I guess that's why I'm, I guess I'm, I'm comfortable going to different places, like even coming here with, with all you, because I've gone to different communities. And when I worked in, in that job, I would go to group homes, foster homes, residential homes. And I don't know if you've ever seen that show, uh, uh, Super Nanny. Remember that old shoe? Yeah, some of you? Yeah. Well, I was Super Manny, you know. I used to go into the homes and, and help the parents regain control of their kids. And, and um, it was difficult, but I, I saw a lot of racism. I saw domestic violence. I saw a lot of fathers that were absent. So I worked with a lot of moms and help them regain control of their kids. So this work is really me addressing that and also addressing my, uh, I guess you would say, broken relationship that I've, I had with my father. Now it's, it's come together, but it's taken a lot of work. And this is me kind of looking all that stuff. Oh, and the show was called A Hero's Nothing But a Sandwich. Anyone seen that movie or read that book? No? It's a good one. I recommend it. Um, but the, in that story, it's about this, this young boy who ends up getting into drugs, and he has this, the dad took off, and his mom is um, together with a new guy. And he's, he's really a good guy, and he's trying to like, encourage him and help him out, but he won't take it you know, because he feels he's going to be abandoned. So he tells him, you know what? A hero is nothing but a sandwich. You know? So it's like nothing. You know, heroes don't exist. So this is me kind of looking at those issues within this body of work. So this is a cotton tapestry, and in the center is a kid that I was working with, and is this idea that as a young boy, you have all these male you know, figures. Some of them could be positive, some of them could be negative, but at the end, they're there for you to select from. Sometimes people select you know, positive choices, sometimes bad choices, and sometimes some people think that the positive choices might be negative ones as well in our society, right? So you have George Lopez, Kanye West, Jack, Jackie Chan, Snoop Dogg, you know, uh, a, a gang member from Mara, Mara Salvatrucha, Obama, you know, uh, and a couple other pastors in there, Martin Luther King. So this is how the, the detail looks when you get close to these tapestries. Um, and then I was thinking about how we celebrate certain holidays in relationship to genders, right? But for me, my father was, he was there, but he didn't really do things for us. So for me, my mom, she was, you know, that's when it came to Father's Day, that's, that's who I thought of, you know, Mother's Day, Father's Day. So again, here's another detail. And then I did uh, these sculptures. Um, and and uh, they're like about this, this one's about this big. You know, and it's using Guatemalan fabric, so it's me really looking at um, the the sculpture. I mean, the toys, the stuffed animals I grew up with, and this one's called "All Grown Up, Never Never Grew," 2013. Um, the idea that as we grow up, um, we we carry trauma, we carry the experiences as kids, um, as much as we want to say that we've grown up. You, you know, if you, if, I don't know, if, is anyone married in here? Nobody's married. 
Oh, okay, cool. Uh, but when you, when you get married, you realize that you, you bring all your baggage, and uh, they bring all their baggage as well. And, and then you have to, you know, two broken people come together, and then you either work at, you know, going to school, and going to school for me is, for me, my wife's name is Eileen, going to the school of Eileen and learning about her, and, and her going to the school of Neri and learning about me. Um, and in that process, being able to um, grow and, and adapt, right? Um, but we do bring in that trauma, and uh, that comes out a lot when you're married, because now you're not dealing with just yourself, but you have to deal with another human being. And then when you have kids, it even comes out more. It's just amazing. I mean, I've learned so much about myself after having kids. But for me, this work um, really, really addressed that and how, in many ways, I haven't, I haven't grown up, you know? I mean, I guess that's why I'm an artist, right? I'm, I'm really interested in, I mean, I, I was just telling Joanna, uh, I just got this little guy not that long ago, and uh, he's a little puppet, right? Hi, how are you doing? Oh, you're doing good. But, I mean, why, why does this interest me? I, I don't know. I mean, it reminds me of my childhood. I still carry my childhood with me, and whenever I'm doing something, I'm kind of always looking back at it, and um, I think that's why I did this work. I mean, it's, there, there's, it's me thinking about my younger self, right? Thinking about myself as a kid and the things that I went through, um, and even looking at this here, um, being a little kid and hearing the word papi, which has like three different meanings, at least in my culture, Latino culture, Papi is, you know, what I, Central Americans call their dad. Papi is also what I call my little boy when he's small. I say, come here, papi, you know. And then papi is also something you, you know, a term of endearment for your, your partner, right? Oh, papi, right? You know, you've heard that before, right? I know you heard that song, those songs. Uh, but this is a piñata. You all know what piñatas are, right? So essentially, it's, it's made out of felt. Uh, I'll show you a detail. But uh, essentially, what ends up happening is piñatas are celebratory, um, but there's also like an act of violence. I don't know if you've seen those YouTube videos. Oh, that's what I got to do. I got to put one of those in the, in the talk. But YouTube videos where the, the kid is like, hit Spider-Man, hit Spider-Man. And the, and the kid's like, no. And, and then they hug Spider-Man. It's like, I can't hit Spider-Man. That's traumatic. Why do you want me to hit him? Uh, but essentially, this piñata has that, that kind of feeling like it's, it's, it's fragile, but it's celebratory at the same time. Uh, and that's me thinking about my father, right? Uh, I, I, it's therapy, I tell you. <laughs> This therapy. Uh, less guns, more good dads. It's kind of weird. You know, I got, this got written by the uh, LA, LA Times. It got reviewed, and they said, he uses awkward language in his artwork, you know, which it is kind of awkward, but I did it. it did, less guns, more good dads. That was the idea. I don't know if it translates, but that's it. And it was a, it's a graphite drawing, a pencil drawing. So that's a little bit of detail. Uh, here's another one of those sculptures, going where you're going. So it's like carrying that childhood with you growing up. Let's see here. These are kind of cool. Uh, things I learned from my dad and TV, 2013. So I was thinking about, OK, if I'm talking about absentee fathers and those sorts of issues, then you know, can, can I actually have a, a positive example, right? So I thought about, what if I have something that could be mimicked, could be done by other people, but I, I got to start it myself. And so these are drawings that I collaborated with with my son. I think he might have, uh, I think he might have been eight at the time. But um, 
these were drawings since he was four all the way up to eight that I was collaborating with him uh, with. So does anyone know who the one to the left is? I'll give you 10 bucks. No, I don't have that money with me right now. But who is it? Darth Vader, yeah. So that's the, my son said, this is Darth Vader. I said, that's not Darth Vader. <laughs> and he says, no, Dad, it's him without his helmet. Burnt up. I was like, dang, that's pretty cool. I, I got you. OK, cool. And then, of course, he says, I love you, Luke. You know, I put that afterwards, right? But maybe that's the signifier that helped you understand it. If I would have covered that, you would probably see, that's an egg with something on it, right? And then to the, to the right, that's Buzz Lightyear and Woody. So in here, you know, uh, Woody has a flower and it's raining and he's protecting Buzz Lightyear, you know. Woody was always like the, the leader, right? He was the leader in Toy Story. So what I wanted to do is create these drawings where he does something, I do another, and we have this kind of relationship or this narrative that's created. It's a way for me to spend time with him too because as an artist, I was working a lot and to kind of, um, I don't want to get into this word too much, but I'll just mention it, because I, I think it's problematic. And if anyone wants to talk to me about it, I'll, I'll be happy to, to talk to you about it. But the word toxic masculinity, because it's been used a lot, but it takes something that is supposed to be positive and it adds something negative to it, which I think is problematic. Though I understand what it means and I do, um, I do find the idea of it or it, uh, it happening problematic, but I think the there needs to be a different term. Um, there's a lot of problems within language, particularly dealing with identity and stuff that um, I find challenging. But it's me um, trying to display a positive male image, you know? So in here, it's like, you have to the right, you know, very helpful, and you have a verbal expressing. Here it's like, I'm bringing you your balloon. Here is the Incredible Hulk, you know, let me help you with your groceries here, come on, you know, that sort of thing. To the left, the left Spider-Man, can I do anything for you? To the right, well, that's, that's Jesus. That's a little drawing of Jesus that my son did. Um, I was like, who? Who is that? What is that? Zero one. He's like, I don't know. I was like, well, <laughs> okay. But, you know, it's a good Jesus, you know. Uh, I, I've, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I, I think it has to do with, I'm just, something that came to my mind. I think it has to do with people relating to what they see. He sees me. I'm a brown man. Because usually a lot of people paint Jesus and he looks white, right? So it's, um, I'm just noticing that right now. I just never really thought about it, but um, interesting. Okay. My son was woke. All right. Uh, to the left, sorry, to the left, uh, I was thinking about, he drew this picture of Captain America. Um, this one is called, But It Wouldn't Be Nothing Without a Woman. So it's... Uh, it's really championing women, you know, so men championing women. So there's an I in, in the star and stuff. And uh, this is more 80s, but please tell me you've watched E.T. before. All right, cool. I know it says PG, but it throws some, some big bomb words in that movie. I saw it not that long ago. I was like, dang, that's, that's serious. Uh, but it's E.T., you know, holding the Hulk, you know. As you can tell, this Hulk is... Well, no, this Hulk is also... No, he did another Hulk that's really awesome. I don't think it's in here. Uh, and then this one is a Power Ranger mask, and I'm behind it, and that's Chewie and uh, C-3PO. And then it's a joke. I don't know if anyone knows... Does anyone know Spanish in here? No? One person? Two people? Okay. Donde esta Obi-Juan el que no ve? So where is Obi-Wan Kenobi, but... Uh, and, but in English, is, is, where is Juan, the one that can't see? So it's it translate that way. Psh, okay. I hear ain't nothing but a sandwich. Okay. Uh, I did this. I kind of connected it. I, I haven't finished this body of work, but it's these tech. This one's really huge. 
Lord, forgive me for being prejudiced, for being a racist, for being a bigot, for being homophobic, for being sexist. Forgive me for being a hypocrite. Amen. So it's just, I did, I'm doing these prayers. Um, I don't know if you've ever gone to, they, they really, I, I don't see them a lot anymore, but they had, they had these Bible stores, right? Uh, and now they kind of discontinued them. Now you could order them online, but they used to have a bunch of them before. And you used to have these kitschy kind of like tapestries with the sky and the world and a little prayer, you know. Uh, For God so loved the world. No. Oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. I haven't mentioned that, right? I'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, oh, I'll talk about it right now. Uh, so this show was at Biola, which is a Christian university. They invited me to come and, and have an, a, a show. How are we doing? Oh, we're still good. Uh, any questions so far, by the way? No? I'm going to take them out of you. I'm going to go up there and, and meet each one of you personally, and we'll get some questions going. All right. Uh, this was at Biola. It was, it's called I Was a Stranger and You Welcomed Me. And it was really me. Uh, now I'm talking about my mom. You see, it's like therapy, right? So it was really me exploring my mom's experience growing up being an immigrant in, in Los Angeles uh, from Guatemala. Um, so... I'll talk about this piece just real quick, the one to the left. I don't have a video of it, but it's actually um, uh, my son. I took, a, I took a trip with him from L.A. to Calabasas, which is almost like a two-hour uh, bus ride, the same ride that uh, my mom and I used to do as the little kids. And I just wanted him to experience that, like what I experienced. Um, I did end up messing up, and I missed my last bus, and we didn't get home till like 2 in the morning, and my wife was livid. She was like, how dare you? Why? I was so worried, and I wasn't able to talk to you. I'm sorry, my cell phone died. You always do that. You never charge your phone. Does anyone ever tell you that? All right, so then I did these photographs where I would go different uh, places and photograph myself as a kid in these, in these images. And let me see here. Um, I won't show it to you. Uh, I, I had a clip, but this is an interview I did with my mom and the lady she, grew, she worked with who became my godmother, Mary Pat. Um, wonderful soul, wonderful person. Really, you know, when you grow up, you know, as a brown kid and you experience a lot of prejudice, you have a lot of... Um, you know, a lot of fears and a lot of, you know, anxieties about being amongst other cultures. And for me, she changed everything as a kid, you know. And she's, she was family to me. I love her dearly, you know. Um, and uh, so it's an interview of their friendship, essentially, over 38 years of my mom working for her. Um, anyway, so this is... This is me and my mom, and this is Barry at the bottom. That's the same image you saw when I began. Uh, that's my mother. Um, she's holding a pheasant. And that's me and Barry. I won't go into these, but I'll, I'll go into this one. Uh, she's always known that she's not a wetback, but if she's not a wetback, and if it's true that your invention reveals you, then who is a wetback? So this is something I, I kind of appropriated from James Baldwin. And it's really talking about that whatever prejudice, whatever stereotype, whatever insult you have towards another culture really says more about you than it says about the other culture, right? So it's me exploring those. And so within the Latino culture, some of the things that have been said as wetback or beaner, so all those things have their history, right? They have a place where they come from. And it really says more about those people than it does about, you know, ourselves. My mother did not come from outer space. So, you know, they use the word alien. It's like, well, she's not an alien. Um, and this is in Spanish, mi mamá nunca ha volado en un omni. She's never flown in a UFO. This is a piece that's uh, oil painting. On, these are all oil paintings, oil painting on paper. I did prime it. You can't paint oil on paper or else it'll mess up. In the, isn't that right, teacher? All right. Uh, I was a stranger in Egypt. So really looking at the Bible and looking at 
you know, instances where it talks about uh, being a stranger. Hey, by the way, has anyone ever seen, uh, has seen the Netflix series Messiah? Have you guys, anyone started watching that? It's really interesting, yeah? Uh, there's a little section where they kind of deal with contemporary issues about immigration, which I, I found really interesting in there. And who is my neighbor? Which I, I find very, very, oh man, this story is like one of my favorites in the Bible, right? Where it's really these two cultural groups that really won't, wouldn't interact. And the man who's asking says, you know, well, who is my neighbor? And instead of saying like, you know, just telling everybody, he, he tells them a story, right? So it's this, this art of telling a story and speaking in parables and getting something from it, which I, I really relate to as an artist. Like, this is what I do as a creative person, right? Uh, the Guatemalan American flag. So I, I think when I did this, I was hearing the radio, and there's this, um, there's this story of, this woman that got really upset um, at, this, at this other person in front of her house saying like, how dare you put a flag of another country if you're living in this country uh, outside your house. And they were going back and forth and the lady was saying like, what are you talking about? And then um, at some point the son comes out and says, you know what, I'm in the US military and I have an American flag here. It's just, but these two things are important to us. So, um, is that by, cult, by cultural experience that, that, that people have, and essentially, when you look at it, when you really think about it, everyone has, but not a lot of people talk about it. So it's kind of looking at those sorts of things um, within, within a, a work of art. All right. Uh, let me see here. Uh, should I talk about this? Uh, well, I guess I, I put it in, so might as well. Uh, so this next body of work was influenced by these, these books, Just So Stories. Has anyone read Just So Stories? Yeah? All right. Uh, how about the Butter Battle Book? No? Some, some people? The Butter Battle Book is such an interesting book by Dr. Seuss. You read it? No? Well, the argument goes that one, one side of the, the wall, there's the people that say, oh, no, well, together, the, the, the argument starts that butter goes on top of bread. Right? And then the other people says, no, butter goes on the bottom of the bread. Well, it's, it, you, know, you just flip it and it's either or, right? But it's, how, it's, it's really about war, just the, like the Lorex is about you know, uh, the environment and stuff. Um, so I wanted to you know, connect these. So that just the stories tells the stories of how animals got their spots or how they came into being. And this one really deals with social issues. And I've been a, such a big fan of Dr. Seuss. Did, did anyone know that Dr. Seuss uh, did political cartoons before he started? Some of you did? Yeah, so we have this one here. It says, what this country needs is a good mental insecticide. Gracious, what was that in my head? Racial prejudice bug. Yeah, so, uh, but anyway, he did a lot of these. Some of them were really not that good, and he got... Um, he got some backlash from it, particularly from the Asian community. But there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and so I wanted to have that flavor within this show. So I was looking at um, creating a narrative about a black panther and a brown bear. The, the bear, his name is Corky, and the panther, his name is Bunchy. And it's really me looking at tensions between African Americans and Latinos and using these, you know, and, you know, I guess anthropomorphic creatures to begin to tell this, this narrative and really talk about certain issues. So this one says, for far away, very far behind, Corky's father went and left, but Corky will always bear in mind the strong mother that he kept, right? So it's like, and it happens within bears. The father takes off and the mama bear raises the cub and they have to protect the cub because sometimes the male bears come back and they want to tear them up, they want to eat them, you know, depending on uh, if they can't find any fish or what have you. Um, but in, again, like with my experience working with families where a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of positive male figures, so that's what I wanted to do. Same thing here. And uh, in some of this, this text I'm taking from uh, just those stories and then I add some other 
you know, poetry into it. So it's kind of kind of weird writing as well, like it's awkward stuff. I've never seen a site that was without mommy dear, but I can say my future is bright because my lessons have been clear, right? Anyway, th these guys set off, and, and here or hereabouts they meet, circling to settle their roles and such. To barter their assumed fret, Corky and Bunchy were curious and much. Corky is brown and does not bite. I am black and must commend. For Corky, he plays without a strike, and he is my first friend. So it's something, a book that I wanted to put together for kids. Um, I'm still working on it, and I just have a couple of pictures, but it was really taking like this old version of style. And, and these things, 58 by 41, so it's, you know, they're, they're really, really huge. They're, they're big, big pieces. And then I had this, this rug in there. Um, it says, our lives matter, we can't breathe. And this is from 2015, where a lot of this talk, you know, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. And so, I, again, since both of this was about, you know, black and brown kind of relationships, I wanted to create a piece, a rug. And this is the first time from this, uh, I've done a couple of uh, sawdust rugs. This is the first time I, I created a rug out of uh, welcome mats. And there's 15 of them. There's one in the exhibition as well. And um, so I created this stencil. So there's a panther, and then there's an e eagle, which is the eagle of the uh, farm workers, uh, UFW, but is also for the brown barrette. So I was looking at brown, brown barrettes and the black panther. And then um, Bunchy is named after Bunchy, Bunchy Carter, who was a, a leader of the Los Angeles chapter of the black panthers. And then Corky, he was a... Chicano activist um, um, during the 60s, 70s. So, and then I was, you know, we can't, I can't breathe, you know, we, we with police brutality, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, but this is, is saying that both these colors, our lives matter, we can't breathe. So I, I find it really interesting and, and usually um, when I talk about this, or particularly the idea of Black Lives Matter, um, during that, that time, and you know, even to today, there's a, the criticism is that all lives matter. And I definitely believe as a Christian, all lives matter, and I think everyone's important, right? But the idea here, and the way I began to understand it, is if my son, my little boy, Mateo, he dies, Something happens to him, and I say, Mateo's life matters. And someone says, no, all kids' lives matter. It's very hurtful, right, to think about it that way, because at that time, someone's dealing with trauma, someone's processing that, and it's just the voice of saying their lives are important, right, because it was happening so much and continues to happen. You know, um, like my pastor recently said, uh, I go to fellowship at, uh, in, in Pasadena, but from, he's in, from Monrovia in, in California. He says, he was speaking to a chief of police, and he says, yeah, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I could honestly say there is prejudice. And if I approach you and you're in a vehicle, I'm sorry to say, but my, my inclination is to say, there's a danger here. I said, I'm a police officer. I'm a, you know, he said, wow, I was so amazed that he was honest and candid with me to tell me that, you know. But that prejudice does exist. I have, you know, people that are in the police force that are family members, and they tell me the same thing, you know. It's just the system. And once you understand that this is the system that you have, then we could begin to do something about it rather than saying no, you know. And the only way it happens is if you talk to people that are actually in the trenches, you know, um, to get a better understanding. Uh, okay, uh, I'll go through this quickly because it's related to the show that, um, that we're in, and I'll give you some time to ask those questions. Uh, have you seen this before? Oh, we're in New York, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of silly sometimes. That's the kid in me. I, I just can't let go of him. The Statue of Liberty, circa 1898. 
So I was really interested in this. It, it just came to mind. Uh, are you familiar with The New Colossus by Emma La Lazarus, who was a Jewish poet, right? Uh, she was uh, born in New York City, July 22nd, 1849, and died November 19th, 1887. Um, so the Statue of Liberty was a gift from France, and it was, you know, it's the idea or, or the, um, the person that came up with it. Uh, I don't know how to say his name, you know, to be honest with you, but Edouard de Libouillel, whatever, but he, he believed in, I don't want to say whatever, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, but he believed that celebrating America's newfound democracy after the Civil War, war as well as the abolition, excuse me, abolition of slavery, could also strain France's democratic ideals. Um, and then Emma Lazarus um, wrote this poem, and it really talks about, you know, this amazing woman who's lighting the way um, for immigrants to come into this country through Ellis Island. Um, so, and I was thinking about just ideas of, of people migrating to, you know, other countries and why, why do they do it, you know. Some stuff is positive, some stuff's negative, you know. There's no clear, this is why, right? So I created this body of work. I'll show you some installation shots. This is called A Place Called Home. And I'll talk about the work. So this, this work um, is another rug I did. It's called The Memorial of the Three Unknown Females. And um, it says unknown female remains, and then a number, unknown female, a number, and then the other one says Cantina Ranch, which is a location. So what would happen is the number one cause of people dying when they cross the desert is dehydration and dying. And a lot of times they're there, and people can't identify them, so they bury them. So these, they have these, you know, John Doe, and then they'll have a number, or sometimes they'll know who it is, you know, but a lot of times they don't. Um, so this, I, I wanted to create a memorial essentially to three women, and, and, and when you migrate, if you're a woman, it's even that much harder because you, you risk getting raped as well, killed, you know, and uh, sometimes, you know, women come with children, and that's a, a very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, crossing and that sort of thing. Um, so what, what has happened, not that, this, this happened in 2014. Uh, this is the University of Indianapolis. Uh, there's some students. Uh, so they were digging up some of these sites that were found in Texas. Um, doing some forensic archaeology, and what they were trying to do is, through DNA sampling, try to find out who these people were to make, to, I guess you would say, to let their family knows, know that we found them, that they passed, but at least you could rest now that you know what happened, right? So I was... It just broke my heart, you know, as a, as a, as a Christian, as a person, that this is happening, you know, and a lot of the times they, they would just toss the remains and they were just redigging them to, to find out who they were. So I did that. And then there's these two pieces in here. One of them is I, I sent here because um, it was part of it, me continuing this conversation again. It's the first time I've done that. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I should send something I showed somewhere else. But um, I was comfortable with it because it was like me continuing my conversation and adding more things onto it. But in here you have a patrol, uh, border patrol vehicle, and it's hard to see. I, I should have gotten a good detail of it, but it has a sticker, and in the bottom it says Mother of Exiles. So what I did is I inserted little pieces of, of the, um, little pieces of, the poem, Emma Lazarus' poem, into it. So this is, uh, this says the golden door. So it's obviously it's not a door, right? It's meant to keep, it's a wall, um, but it's that contradiction. Here it says, um, from her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. So th these are called immigrant landscapes. They're numbered, so it doesn't really matter, either one, two, three, four, five. Um, and these are watercolors. 
So um, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, your need to breathe free. Her mild eyes, this is in the show again. So this, to me, is like me thinking about a woman having mild eyes. Like this is, this is what they thought about the Statue of Liberty, but what, what does mild eyes mean? You know, it's quite poetic, quite beautiful for someone to have passed and, you know, you being remembered as having mild eyes. Um, and then I did these pieces here. Um, these, these are just signs um, that um, are done like uh, to pay to pay homage to somebody who who sacrificed or a parent that sacrificed to come here. So my father was a bracero. Uh, he suffered a lot. Bracero. Anyone familiar with the bracero program? So there was actual people that were came here legally to work during a certain time. Um, a lot of times they say, yeah, you can stay, and then they'll send them back off. So there was a lot of lying that happened, and that's part of our American history. Uh, my father was a bracero. He suffered a lot. He was far from his family in Mexico, but convinced a good religious man to build a home for his family and brought his family home to the U.S. Years later, my mother cleaned other people's homes and ironed other people's clothes. I stand proud every, every day because of them. I'm, pr I'm proud to be an immigrant. And then this one is my parents and family migrated from Venezuela in 95, 93. Leaving their home wasn't easy, but it was necessary. They did it, and with much sacrifice, that's what the life of an immigrant is. A lot of hard work. Immigrants work hard and long. They love this country, and they're oftentimes feeling, uh, fleeing from something because they, too, want a better life. RD. And I have these initials. And the colors, I did several of these, and the colors deal with location and place, um, uh, and their ceramic tablets on these signs. Um, and my hope was, I'm, I'm working on a project when I get back in, in the desert, and it's a uh, Borrego Springs. It's a lot of snowbird, snowbirds, they call them, right? Snow owls, so, snowbirds. And um, immigrants live there, uh, particularly for the hotel industry. I'm doing a big, big project with a lot of these tablets, and that's, that's going to be my next project coming up. Um, but that's it. Uh, if you want to follow me, that's me on Instagram, and that's my email. If you want to ask me any questions on my website, um, I'm going to open it up for you to ask me any questions. Um, please, please do. I know you guys have questions. Be brave. Who's a brave person? Yes, sir. Did you ever watch Mr. Rogers? Did I ever watch Mr. Rogers? <laughs> I'm very much influenced by Mr. Rogers. You know, um, um, he, not having that father figure, he was like one of my first male influences that I had that I think really transformed the way I look at things. Um, and that's essentially why I got that little tiger for... Daniel the Striped Tiger, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for coming and speaking to the class. Yeah. It's uh, definitely very beneficial for all our patients here. Yeah. But I'm also, uh, I really love the, um, uh, like, like the barbershop work that you guys mm. know, that was very, you know, like passionate and uh, insightful. You know, lastly, my question was, you know, who cuts your hair? Because you know, your old face is looking real nice. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I have a, I go to two places. I have a like traditional barbershop that I go to. And they do like the whole blade and everything, and you know, you razor. Can cut my hair if you want, yeah, I could cut your hair. Yeah, I, I don't know. If, I wish I could cut. I've tried cutting my hair, and it just doesn't work. It's very hard. Uh, any any other questions? Yes. Well. I mean, I, I talked to her a lot. Like, I just talked to her, and she was really sad this, this, um, this morning uh, because um, a Guatemalan family that, you know, she, she does crisis response, so she goes into, you know, different schools and kind of deals with crisis, trauma, and stuff. And um, one, of, one of the family was, was deported, and they're a Guatemalan family, and the little boy is eight, and his name is Mateo with a double T, like my son. 
So it was, it was, it was crazy, you know, just to, to hear that. Um, but we talk a lot about that. Um, we talk a lot about suicide because um, it's, it's, I mean, I think during our times, particularly with social media, trying to keep up with, you know, also with appearance and body issues and stuff like that, there's a lot of that um, that, you know, we talk about. And, and um, I think as an artist, um, I, and as a Christian, I'm, I, I want to be able to contribute something positive, you know, um, not about myself, but about, you know, what's going on in our society, you know. So we do communicate, um, and uh, oftentimes a lot of those conversations, you know, uh, inspire me to do something, some work. Or... What's your major? Oh, is it? Going to get an MSW at point? Awesome. Cool. It's very versatile, very versatile field. You had a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to be a pastor before, and um, so I was going to go to seminary school, and, uh, and, and then it's like I always felt like I, I needed to draw, and I needed to do that. Actually, when I was a kid, my, the lady that my mom worked for, her son worked for Walt Disney, and he was an animator, and he used to sit down and draw with me, and he taught me a lot of things. Um, and then um, I think it was at that point, you know, later on when I, when I did get older, um, I, went through, I went through a stage where I, I, I was embarrassed of my mother, embarrassed of my mother's brownness. I, was, I, I, I wanted to be different. I went to a predominantly white school, you know, so I didn't like to stand out. Um, and... Um, and then I started learning more, and, and like people started to show me things, and I became very proud of who I was. And looking at it in the biblical context, you know, I, I realized that we're all important as human beings. And then there's errors in, in, in every sides of different stories, you know. And I and I wanted to begin to talk about that because I think we're we're living in a society where, again, to repeat myself where people want to listen to rebuttal, not to understand. You know, it's like people get really upset. You know, they start hearing somebody else, and they're like, you know, and it's not like, well, tell me more. You know, how did you come to understand that? I see things differently, but maybe, you know, your upbringing, you know, made me think different. You know, so at, at that point, it's like I felt like, no, this is God's work, and I've worked in the jail system. I've worked with incarcerated youth. I've done artwork with them. I, I, I didn't show any of that stuff. I got other things, you know, but, you know, that's when I really, I said I could do something for the Lord within this, yeah. So, um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I think, I think, you know, I, I think this goes back to um, even, tell me your name. Yeah. <laughs> Mariana, this goes back into what Mariana was, was asking about the you know, social work. Um, uh, you, you don't have to be necessarily an expert to help or to get in the conversation. You just have to be, um, have that love and be respectful to the community or the people that you're working with or you're talking about, um, you know, because uh, you know, I work with kids that had, you know, um, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and, you know, and I helped them. I didn't have those things, but I was able to come in and, and help them because I, I found it important. So I think if you approach it that way where you're like, well, you know, I, the, I see people suffering. I want to be able to talk about it, but you don't, you don't want to come in and like, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not coming in and necessarily talking about African-American culture. I'm talking about my experience with it. And some work that I showed really talked about the prejudice that Latinos have towards African-Americans. So I, I'm viewing it towards that lens, right? Um, and, and if I collaborate with someone, you know, then it's like I want their input. But it's always, you know, you don't, you, you don't want to get to a point where in the, in the hopes of generating dialogue about a particular situation, you begin to exploit that particular culture, 
right? So those are the kind of things I ask myself. And I have conversations with other people. What do you think about this? I had this idea, you know, people that I value and I trust to be able to kind of get those things out. Does that help? All right, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, depends, you know, um, a lot of that is I, I, I outsource. And then sometimes, you know, I, I do, like a lot of my stuffed animals, I sew them together. Um, there's other, there's some stuff in the show that I sewed together. Uh, you know, interesting enough, <laughs> sorry, I go on tangents, but oh well, uh, it's who I am. Uh, I took some jeans, some blue jeans that I just got into get tailored, because um, they're too long, not these, some dark ones, the ones I was wearing yesterday. And I went in and they told me, you know, they, I took him to the person that does it. We outsourced, and he said he wouldn't do it because you just folded it, and you didn't put a line or put a, a pin on it. I said, you got to be kidding me. I was like, oh, man. I really wanted these. I really, really wanted to wear these pants. Um, so I said, you know what? I could sew. I'm going to do it, you know? Um, I have a sewing machine. I had the thread. I've been wanting to do it for a long time. And it, I'm not trying to floss or put myself on a pedestal. But I did an excellent job. <laughs> they came out sweet. I'll show them to you. you you'll, they came out really good. I mean, it took me a little bit to figure it out. But, um, but yeah, I, I love doing that. And I think that, um, you know, that's, that's the thing where, as an artist, I, I like to kind of, some, somebody else, you know, brought it up that if, if you know, hey, does your work deal with femininity and this and this? I said, well, no, it just, things that I'm interested in, you know, so it doesn't have to be labeled that or what have you, you know, so, yeah. Um, any, any other questions? Or forever hold your peace, yes. Um, what part of Guatemala were you born in? I was not born in Guatemala, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, one or the other. I guess, uh, I guess, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> That's a political conversation there. Um, but my family's from Guatemala. Uh, my father's side, which is interesting in love, uh, I'm, I'm closer to his family, um, uh, is from Retauleo. And then my mother's side is from uh, San Marcos, which is close to the border of Mexico. But I've spent a lot of time there. And, I used, and as a kid, I would go back and forth. And I'm, I'm very much influenced by that culture. And, that whole exhibition is about Guatemala, you know, so, yeah. Any other questions? I think I got one more in me. No? All right, thank you so much. It's a, it's, thank you.